And Jesus said to his disciples, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Proclaim not just to his sons, but his beloved daughters. Not just the privileged few, but to the entire human race. To the whole creation, to all the colors and creeds, for God so loved all of us. How then can one daughter be more worthy than another? One son be more deserving than his brother? One color be more beautiful than all the rest? For it is written that no one can number his children. They will come from every nation. They will come from all tribes. They will speak all languages. And with their mouths they will sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Therefore, we are all created in his image, not just a certain few. We are all adopted. None of us are his by birth. And we all must find the way, the truth, and the life. We all need Jesus. Jesus, the martyr. Jesus, the poor man. Jesus, the prisoner. Jesus, the teacher. Jesus, the prophet. Jesus, the resurrected. Jesus, the first and the last. He is the creator of diversity, the author of equality, the defender of the defenseless, the one who breaks the chains of slavery, the one who continues to fight for freedom. He is the Messiah. He is the risen King. He is our only hope. Jesus, the savior of the world. Jesus, the one who died for all. Good morning, brethren. What is the most important thing in our life? What do we value in our life? The answer can be quite varied. Um, there can be a number of things that we value in life like health, family, wealth, the accum either the accumulation of wealth or even just valuing the fact that we struggle to make ends meet. It could be fame, the ability to influence others, or the acquisition of knowledge, um, just knowledge in itself. But today in our reading, I would like to open a window in Jesus' mind to discover what was most important for him and considering that we are his followers, what is important for us as well? We'll read it in Mark chapter 1 and verses 29 to 39. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was laying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her, and he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he was not permitting the demons to speak, because they knew who he was. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place, and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him, they found him, and they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go somewhere else, to the towns nearby, so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. Well, brethren, picture this moment. 
But let's picture it as if we saw it from Jesus' own eyes. And, and let's begin with verse 29. Let's review it together. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her. And she waited on them. When evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city had gathered at the door, and he healed many who were ill with various diseases, and cast out many demons. Now, Peter's mother-in-law had a high fever. Elsewhere is stated that she had a serious fever, a high fever, a dangerous fever. But Jesus healed her instantly and completely. When the Sabbath had finished after the sun had set, they brought all sorts of people to him for him to heal them. And the whole city here is gathered together at the door and there is a, a great opportunity for Jesus to continue to heal other people. Healing. Think about it. How important is health in our life. And how important would it be in our days to be able to heal others? Let's look at it from Jesus' eyes for a moment, what the opportunity that he had in that moment. Imagine being a physician, for example, and all of a sudden you're given the authority to heal everyone you touch. Wow, what a difference. And of course it's important. Because health is important indeed. And the ability to relieve an individual from suffering and pain and, and illness is also very important. But what about knowledge? Many regard knowledge and understanding as the most important thing in life. Now that's interesting that here the demons that Jesus cast out knew who he was. Think about it for a moment. They had a precious knowledge. They knew that Jesus was the Son of God. They knew his identity. They knew what other people should have known. They knew what you and I need to know. But still, they never surrendered to him or God, the Father. They rejected him. They went against him rebelled against him to the core. But look, he was, in verse 34, he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Now that knowledge is a precious, precious knowledge. To know who Jesus is is truly a precious knowledge. And yet Jesus wasn't looking for that knowledge to just come to the surface and, and spread out. He rebuked them because the time was not ready, first of all. But also, that's not what he was looking for. What about fame? What about being known, being famous? Many have given their life to gain some fame. People, people have been doing daring things or, or things to attract the attention of the media, of the crowds, of just for fame, just to have their moment in the spotlight. And in some cases, they went too far and lost their life in the attempt to gain that fame. People want to be known and they want to be acknowledged. They want to be a knowledge for what they think. They want to be a knowledge for what they do. The reasons vary, but most of us really want to be known and acknowledged, don't we? And 
Some go very far to get their moment in the spotlight. Unfortunately, some even engage in criminal behavior to get that spotlight. A number of people have acquired power and have waged wars. They have deceived and fought and lied. Everything and anything for that fame. But let's face it, having the opportunity to influence others is not necessarily in and by itself evil. It's not in necessarily something that is wrong. It's not bad in and by itself. In fact, having the opportunity to influence others can be very important. And there's no doubt on that. It presents a great opportunity to make a difference, to propose and promote change, change for the better, hopefully. So having the opportunity to be known and to be of influence to others can be good. But let's notice verses 36 and 37. Simon and his companions search for him. Remember, he had gone and left early in the morning. They went out searching for him, and they found him. And they said to him, Jesus, everyone is looking for you. Of course, that statement, that excla ex exclamation sounds excited, doesn't it? Look, everyone is around looking for you. What are you doing here? All alone, isolated. Come on, the implied in that statement is, come on and, and, and be there with the people. They're looking for you. This is a great opportunity. They're acknowledging you. But Jesus didn't go to the crowd, did he? He did not seek that fame. He did not seek that acknowledgement of the crowd. What was most important for Jesus? What was important for him? Was healing people? Well, yes, he did. And he healed a lot of people. And that was one of the aspects of his ministry. And definitely an important aspect. But was it the most important aspect? Having or sharing knowledge? Well, we may safely say that if it was someone on the face of the earth who, who knew, who had perfect theology, who knew the things that we, we, we strive to understand, was him. But did he flaunt that knowledge? Did he boast in that knowledge? What about recognition and fame? Was he seeking that? Although it was important, was that the most important thing for him? Let's notice it together in verse 35. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Verse 35 pictures Jesus isolating himself from the crowd, isolating himself from anybody. The disciples had to go out looking for him. They eventually they found him. But what for? To nurture his relationship with the Father, God the Father. What was important for Jesus in that moment was his relationship with God, his communion with the Father, his oneness with the Father. That relationship, that communion, that oneness with the Father was part an important part of his life. And a, a, an important part that he never neglected. Now, was prayer an end to itself? Was Jesus there in isolation so he can pay his 30 minutes of prayer or, or, or whatever people set up as, as goals? Was that an end to itself? Did Jesus just bask in his relationship with the Father? Did he have perhaps another purpose as well. Of course, he was nurturing and maintaining 
that close relationship with the father that he had, but it was not apart from his mission. For God the Father had sent him, and he had come on this earth to accomplish a mission for something extremely important. And notice how that is described in verses 38 and 39. Let's read it together. And he said to them, Let us go somewhere else, to the towns nearby, so that I, that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. Now you might say, wait a minute. He's not going to the crowd. The crowd was right there at, at his doorstep. The whole town had gathered together. And they were still gathering together, but Jesus left, isolated himself, spent time with God the Father in prayer. And then after praying, he made a statement. And he said, let us go elsewhere. Because what I came for was to preach the gospel. Jesus had ample opportunity to find all the things that we tend to crave in life. He had the opportunity to find purpose in his purpose in, in healing and helping others. And that's definitely helping others is a very good thing, right? He had the opportunity to boast his perfect knowledge. He had the opportunity to enjoy popularity and fame and perhaps use that for a great deal of good as well. And in many ways he did. But these were not the most important thing for him, was it? What was most important for him was the mission he had come in to accomplish. And that mission can be summarized in that one word, the gospel. So how important is the gospel? How important was it for Jesus? Why was it important for Jesus? And how important is it for us even today, as his disciples, as his followers. Think about the gospel. The gospel is a good news of what God has done to redeem us. The good news of what God has in store for us. The good news of salvation, the good news of glorification. And Jesus, <coughs> in this opportunity that he had, concentrated himself on that mission, on that message, the good news, the gospel. That's what he was born for. That's what he lived for. It is the gospel that he lived for. It is the gospel that he made himself sin for, the good news of lifting sin and the penalty of sin away from us and taking it on himself. It's for the gospel, for that good news of, of redemption that he suffered agonizing pain for us. It's that good news that he died for and that he was reasoned for. It is for the cup of communion, the cup of oneness, that he shared with his disciples and through his disciples offered it to all of us at that last supper just before he took on himself for us on our behalf the cup of reeling the cup of the filth of a human sin the cup of the wrath of God even and what did he do that for? so that he could share with us good news. Good news of forgiveness. A forgiveness that only him can extend to us. A good news of forgiveness that comes at a price, a very high price, but it's a price that he paid for us. And so it's good news of redemption. It is a good news of sanctification as he calls us to be transformed through his presence in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. 
It is good news of glorification. As he pointed out the future that he has in mind in store for us. In sharing his glory. That he, as he said in the prayer to the Father in John 17, where he said to the Father, Father, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. The good news of God's love, because in the same sentence, when he said, the glory that you have given to me, I have given to them. Yes, God, the Son, has given the glory that God the Father has given to God the Son. He has given that glory to you. And in that same sentence, he said that the world may know that you sent me, but he also said that, no, that the world may know that you love them. Brethren, he says that he loves you, that the Father loves you even as you love me, Jesus said. And in that statement, the good news is that God loves you, and he loves you just like he loves his only begotten Son, Jesus the Messiah. It is a good news of a God who shares it all with you and with us. A God who shares even himself. It is a good news of a God who shares his very glory and all that he has created with you now and forever. So the question remains, how important is the gospel for us? Do we look at the gospel as being, oh, yeah, I know, I heard that many times before. Jesus loves you. Yeah, I heard that. Big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. It is a big deal because that is the message of good news that Jesus came for. That is the message of good news that God himself made himself human for. He took upon himself our humanity. He took upon himself our sinfulness. He took upon himself our penalty, our death, so that he can extend life, real life, to us. And oneness and communion and glory. And a future that defies our wildest imagination because he has called us, Revelation 3, he has called us to sit with him on his throne, to rule with him over all creation. For he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you, brethren, are those kings and lords under him. How important is the gospel? More than anything else, it's the most important message in the entire universe. It's the most important message that God has for us. Would we live for it? Would we be willing to die for it? Or even more importantly, perhaps, are we willing to share it and to share all things for that most important message. Because brethren, God did that. And God did it for us. And that God who gave himself for us, that God who gave himself so that he can pass on those, that good news for us, is a God who called us to follow him is a God who called us to love one another just as he loved us to love even our enemies and to share with them even our enemies to share with them what the most important thing that we have the good news brethren that is the most important treasure that we possess the good news 
of Jesus Christ, the good news of redemption, the good news of salvation, the good news of glorification, the good news of an eternity that God has set in motion for us, that God has set apart for us, that God has in store for us an eternity that we'll spend as we share in that government with Him, in that rule with Him, because we're going to be sitting with Him on His throne. So God has called us to be His followers, to follow Him. Let's do that. Let's make sure that we review what this gospel is all about, that we really understand it, that we understand it for the depth that it has, for the importance that it has, and let's make sure that we are willing to live for it and to share it, because that's the most precious gift we can give our loved ones in this world. God bless you. Shepherd, what could I want? I follow after you. You lead me out front. You are a good shepherd. You know me by name. By still waters, love will never change. You are a good shepherd. You are all I need. You bring perfect peace. You're close beside me. You are a good shepherd You say it's time to feast Even though I am surrounded By the darkest enemy You are a good shepherd You call me your own Couple overflow goodness and love.